All right. Welcome, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and get us started. So, um, like I said, welcome to our um, um, online information session. We're going to be focusing on um, medical humanities, social medicine. You'll, uh, Dr. Anderson and Dr. Sadowski will talk a lot more about the terminology and the words and kind of the background a little bit, but um, really it's this idea of exploring health beyond biology. Ultimately, there's much more to health than just the science. Um, and so we're excited to have you join us and learn a bit, little bit more about that and how it fits within um, our master's in bioethics and medical humanities program. So I'm Dr. Leah Jeanette, I'm the assistant director of education and a senior research associate in the department I'm gonna be hosting. Um, and I just wanna cover a couple basic things. So agenda, uh, we're gonna talk about Case Western Reserve University where we're located and the School of Medicine. We'll talk about medical humanities and social medicine. We'll go into our master's program um, with an overview. We'll talk about application process and deadlines, uh, student assistantships and financial aid, and of course, Q&A. As we're going through, if you have questions, please feel free to use the Q&A feature here in Zoom. Um, go ahead and type your question in. We may answer it while we're going, or we may save it to the end. Um, either option is fine. And I will next introduce our panelists. So we have Dr. Eileen Anderson, and we have Dr. Jonathan Sadowski. Um, Dr. Anderson is the Director of Education uh, in the Department of Bioethics here in the School of Medicine at Case Western Reserve. She's also an uh, associate professor of bioethics and the director of the Medicine Society and Culture Concentration within our master's program. And Dr. Jonathan Sadowski is the Theodore J. Castle professor in the Department of History. He also has an appointment in the Department of Bioethics as well. And he's the associate director of Medicine Society and Cult Culture Concentration. Um, I will also let them both introduce themselves much more extensively. There's a lot of other things they probably could list under their names and their experience and um, thoughts. So thank you both so much for joining us today and we're excited to hear from you. Thank you so much, Dr. Jeanette. It is wonderful to be here and get to talk about our Masters of Bioethics and Medical Humanities and in particular, the Medicine Society and Culture Concentration, which is our deep dive into medical and health humanities and social medicine. And you're yeah. right. It's, you know, when we talk about, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more when we talk about um, medical health humanities and social medicine and arts and medicine really as well. It is a wide array of humanities disciplines, social science, and arts. And we have crafted this program to have faculty expertise across all those areas also. So I am uh, a social scientist trained, trained also in humanities actually, um, and neuroscience, but my, I did a, a dual doctoral training in human development and psychology and medical anthropology. Um, so at the heart of hearts, I am an anthropologist and bring um, the social science background to this program. And for many reasons, including our complementary strengths, I am so delighted um, to introduce Dr. Jonathan Sadowski, who is currently chair of our Department of History. Thanks, Eileen. Um, yeah, I don't really want to say all that much about myself because I want to focus on the program. Uh, I do come from a history background and mostly humanities, but studied a great deal of anthropology myself uh, during my training. And I also studied um, psychiatric epidemiology um, while I was training in graduate school. So I'm interested in bringing the social sciences and the humanities together. And that's one of the things that really makes this program really distinctive is how much we really try to, it's really radically interdisciplinary. And we try to see what the different perspectives really bring to each other. What can we learn from using them together that we can't use, we can't learn when we just study them from one point of view. 
Absolutely. And we are so lucky to be joined from colleagues across the school and across the university and the region who are experts in other social sciences, humanities, and arts. So let's talk for a minute about the School of Medicine. It is an incredible and dynamic place to be. Um, it is the number one ranked um, School of Medicine in the state. And it's always in the top 25, depending on how you um, slice it in the country. It is a dynamic um, campus full of research and clinical experience um, and research across the different facets from bench to field work. Today, I was with our medical students in a panel on global health. So the work, you know, under the microscope at the individual level, at the clinical level, locally and globally is really dynamic. The School of Medicine um, has many interdisciplinary departments, both in the basic sciences and in all sorts of uh, clinical science. And as we'll mention in a little bit, our students have the opportunity to get exposure to many of these um, partnering organizations and fields as they go through the program. We are situated in the Department of Bioethics, which is in the School of Medicine, um, which is a dynamic interdisciplinary department of faculty from many different backgrounds. We also have faculty affiliates across the university, like Dr. Sadowski, um, and we have faculty embedded in four major hospital systems abutting the university. We also work with faculty who work in the Cleveland Museum of Art, in other community organizations, Department of Public Health, um, et cetera. So situated in the School of Medicine, which is one of eight schools at Case Western Reserve University, we have access to a whole variety of experts and resources, and it's a wonderful place to be housed for an interdisciplinary program. So the question is, what are medical humanities? And, and increasingly, and depending on your context, you'll hear the term health humanities and social medicine, and why do these matter? So Dr. Sadowski, can I kick it to you first to weigh in on these questions? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think that um, they matter because we've seen increasingly in recent decades that medical health problems are human problems. They're not simply technical problems. There's no doubt that we need to do everything we can to advance science and technology, but we also need to, um, we also need to understand, for example, the cultural contexts in which patients and illnesses arise. We need to understand social structures. We need to understand um, what kinds of communities people come from. And we need to understand how they make sense of their illness experiences and their health for that matter. What are the explanatory models that they hold in their mind? Um, these are vital for ethics. These questions are vital for ethics. They're vital for clinical encounters. They're vital for epidemiological study. They're vital in, for every dimension of health and illness. Thank you so much. I think that's so well said. And given the complexity of the human condition of health and illness and suffering and wellness, we, in the program, we try to expose students to different levels of analysis. So in, in the realm of social medicine, really thinking about political economy, looking at um, 
epidemiology, looking at health disparities, and working our way into behavioral sciences, really understanding, you know, what do people actually do and why do they do it? For example, we've had all this controversy about mask wearing. Well, why does someone wear a mask and what does it mean to them? Why don't they? What, what might it mean there? What other issues are at play and what other values are underlying their behavioral choices? Um, and then thinking about meaning um, and representation and taking some critical humanistic um, analytic approaches to understand the ways that we represent not only um, disease and uh, illness and conditions and human suffering and uh, healing, um, but also even more fundamental concepts such as, you know, what is the body and how might different cultures or subcultures approach an understanding of the human body differently, which has massive implications at systemic levels, um, et cetera. So the, and then we can also look, we, we engage questions of arts and medicine in many different ways, looking at how the human body and its experiences of wellness and illness have been represented has had a huge impact. Um, it, it continues to and has throughout time. Um, learning the tools of artistic analysis. So for example, our students get training in the art of seeing at our Cleveland Museum of Art with some phenomenal art historians. Um, that experience of learning training in art and art history actually has been shown to improve um, clinical diagnosis for clinicians. So whether someone is going down a clinical path, maybe an MD, a DO, um, nursing, dental medicine, other types of clinical practice, or maybe going on to um, further study in a PhD or um, another advanced degree, or thinking about a law degree, thinking about health law, thinking about the structural, behavioral, humanistic, um, and arts interface um, makes for a better and more powerful clinical encounter and analysis. And, you know, as the slide is depicting healthcare impacts us all and understanding these multi-level um, kind of how the system is, is set up from a political, economic, and values point of view down to people's experience in a clinical encounter, both patients and physicians and anyone else involved um, really can pave the way to better clinical care. And I think as we've seen um, during the pandemic, but also in, you know, our R&D, our interfaces, um, we were talking today, Dr. Jeanette, about some of our advances in AI and medicine and biomedical engineering, um, in stem cell and um, personalized medicine, all of these advancements that are happening in R&D, in science and technology, they lead us to these other questions, not what can be done, but what should be done, when should it be done, how should it be done, how do we take seriously social justice concerns. So for example, in the COVID-19 pandemic, thinking about, you know, the interface of a, a ventilator and then asking, you know, not what is the technology that can aid in this particular medical crisis, but how, what do we do when we have a scarce supply? How do we allocate? When should we step in, et cetera? Um, so that being a technology that we've had a, around for a lot longer, but some of our more cutting edge technologies um, beg the, the social scientific 
humanistic um, and ethical investigation to figure out um, the the uh, not only the application but also in the very development of how something is interfaced with um, to make sure that it is maximizing what it is intended to do. I'd like to add another example. So um, one thing we learn from the study of the history of medicine is that as medical technology has developed over the last 200 years or so, one of the things, one of the unfortunate consequences of that has been that the story of the patient has receded into the background. Visual images that we can increase, that we can increasingly develop from what now seems like a relatively simple technology like x-ray, which was of course at one time cutting edge to um, you know, brain imagery, imaging, and other kinds of technologies. Now, all of that pushes the story of the patient into the background to some extent. There are lots of opportunities within our program to study narrative, to think about stories, to think about what kinds of stories, because every illness in some way is a story, It's a, and it is for the person experiencing it a story. And this um, relevance of narrative expands on a wider level as well, because not only are individual illness experiences stories, but social problems like epidemics are stories too. What kinds of stories do we tell? What are our expectations of the drama of a particular epidemic? And when does the story end? Who gets to decide that it's over? Is the COVID pandemic over now or are we still in the middle? And how do we decide that? Who gets to decide that? And what kinds of judgments are being made? Is that being made on objective scientific grounds or is it a combination of culture, politics, et cetera? Thank you. That's a great example. And we could go on and on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I mean, engage students to do through our coursework. We have students um, engage many different points of view on different kinds of health problems, whether it's infectious disease, chronic disease, um, mental health concerns. Again, looking at new technologies, looking at multiple models of wellness, etc. Um, so we get the question all the time, how this degree, and in particular, this concentration helps a student's career path. Um, and it, you know, it depends for every student. The way that we think about this program, um, as we're building a class and building an experience over an intensive one year, is that we love to shape a class where students are coming in with all different backgrounds. So quite a number of our students are preclinical. They're coming in with hard science backgrounds. Um, and they want this intensive nine-month experience to then um, broaden the way that they look at their next step in clinical practice. And they come back. We now have, we're going on 26 years of alum um, and, you know, well over a thousand alum. And they come back and tell us how this experience kind of shaped um, their pathway through clinical practice for the rest of their lives. Um, so that's one pathway. Um, there, students who are coming to us going on to law may, um, again, kind of really get this multidisciplinary interprofessional perspective to take into what they're doing. Um, and, you know, same if a student is going on to another kind of graduate program or a PhD, um, where they have experience really looking at the multiple perspectives, multiple stakeholders, multiple disciplines involved um, in any particular um, health issue before they go on. So we also, um, students get some wonderful experience as they go through our program, and that can be shaped depending on, on their intention and their interest. Um, but we have students who go on to all kinds of different careers. You know, some of them are listed there. Um, and what I wanna highlight 
is the notion of discernment. So we end up every year with a subset of students who are not exactly sure what they want to do for their career. So they know that they want to do something in health. They want to gain more exposure to what are various career pathways in health besides, say, becoming a doctor or a nurse. Um, and they they want to come in to, to talk with people who have taken these different career paths, learn about what are they bringing to the table, either in a clinical pathway, a research pathway, an analytic pathway, whatever it might be, or representational artistic pathway. Um, so this um, the program really allows for exploration and discernment to help articulate what a particular student wants to go forward in for their next steps. So, so we are, see... oh, go ahead. No, just uh, so you can see here, um, this is the basic outline of the program. Um, it's usually a two semester program and um, you need a certain amount of um, credit hours. The um, we in the MSc concentration, we require um, at least one elective in social sciences and one elective in humanities. I don't know if I'm getting ahead of myself. I don't remember the slide order, but um, we do have a core course called Foundations of Medicine, Society and Culture. Uh, Professor Anderson and I co-teach that. We love co-teaching it. We teach it every year. It's a great experience. It's always a little bit different. Um, even though the topics are largely the same, but every student group is a little bit different. So it's a it's great, great deal of fun. And um, yes, everybody is gets a, gets assigned uh, an advisor that's available to them to help them find students. I did want to mention one thing that might not have been clear about the electives. The electives can be possibly within the Department of Bioethics, but they don't have to be. They can be anywhere in the university. Some students take their social science electives in the School of Law or in the Sociology Department in the College of Arts and Sciences. Some students take their humanities elective in the Department of English or with me in the History Department. Uh, the other ones I just want to highlight here are we have an incredible um, option that's been coming online as we're handling um, the pandemic better of study abroad classes. And we've been um, running short-term study abroad for decades. So right now we are working with our students who are excited to head off for a spring break course um, in Amsterdam. And we have a number of these short-term classes that really immerse you um, you know, to really learn about different cultural contexts, specific kinds of topics and questions, or looking at comparative medical systems. For example, we have one of those in Costa Rica. Um, we also do have a personalized advising system to try and help each student figure out um, you know, what are the, what's the right pathway for me? There are certain things that are required for every student. Um, there is a, another foundations course that is two semesters required for all students. That is the backbone of bioethics and medical humanities. And all of our students, um, get 80 hours per semester of clinical, um, hours in one of four hospital systems. And we love kind of diving into this um, in the medicine, society, and culture track too, because one of the topics of conversation is the culture of a hospital. We have two private hospitals, um, Cleveland Clinic and University Hospitals, and two public hospitals, our county hospital, Metro Health, and one of the largest VA centers um, in the country. And each of these hospital systems works differently. So our students generally spend one semester in each um, a, a private and a public hospital to, to see different types of delivery of medicine um, in the same city. 
And for a medicine society and culture concentrators, depending on what your career goal is, um, we also have the option for personalization in the spring for a different kind of practicum. If somebody is very interested in global health or public health, or maybe is going on to a PhD and wants a, uh, to really dive in to a research project or something like that for a practicum experience. So you would work with your advisors um, and the three of us actually in helping to shape the right experience for you. And all students also complete a capstone where they really become an expert on a topic of their passion. So in our curriculum, um, we it, it turns out it's about half of our students will concentrate in medicine, society, and culture every year. And as Dr. Sadowski was saying, they participate in a, a more intensive foundations course with us in the fall. And they also participate in a, a kind of intellectual breadth, um, thank you, seminar um, that allows students to attend a series of events in humanities, social sciences, and arts that can be on the campus, in the community, in the surrounding institutions, and, and sometimes now zooming in nationally or internationally to make sure that they have exposure to many different disciplinary perspectives. Um, and as Dr. Sadowski mentioned, you, we look and make sure that your electives will give you um, exposure and, and a, a good command of different analytic methods by the time that you graduate. Um, we did mention the clinical rotations that are really a highlight for most of our students. And again, those are the four hospital systems um, that they are part of. Um, and before I mention the other concentrations, Dr. Jeanette, you're the director for the clinical ethical rotations. Do you want to say a word about them? So what I'll say is that um, students have the opportunity to spend about 160 hours in two of the four hospitals. We work with the students to identify what's the right hospitals um, based on their schedule, based on their interests, both in just healthcare in general, but in bioethics and medical humanities specifically. Um, the other great thing besides the actual time in the clinical setting with the different teams, visiting the committees one-on-one -on -one with healthcare professionals is also the weekly meeting. So they meet on a weekly basis with their fellow students and a clinical ethicist or ethics committee member from that hospital. And they actually get to work through the ethical issues, the humanity issues they've observed and they've experienced to really dive deep into what is it? What, what, have, what have I experienced? And similar to what's been mentioned so far, right? Sometimes there's institutional culture reasons why policies are what they are. Sometimes there's political reasons why things are what they are. And it really helps the students to work through that experience. And so it's, it's a fantastic opportunity, um, not just to be in the rotations, but also to have those um, ongoing conversations with each other as well. I was um, talking with a couple of students in the hallway today who were talking about one of those groups and the insight they gained really thinking about the upstream factors behind what they're seeing in kind of downstream patient um, experiences in the clinic and their level of sophistication and really trying to understand the what was at stake in this particular patient's experience was just extraordinary. So uh, uh, for many of our students, they come back and talk about how this experience, what they saw in these hospitals, whether it's healthcare experiences they didn't even know or, or roles that they didn't even know existed previously um, that maybe they're now exploring for a career pathway or maybe it's their first experience with, with a birth or a death. Um, the, regardless, for most students, this is a really powerful part of their education, regardless of what their next step 
and in their pathway is. And I just want to mention the other two um, ways of completing the program thank you, is our traditional program where you're not doing a concentration and then you're working with your advisor to really choose um, your electives very carefully to kind of give you what you need for your next step to build on your interests, whether it's something maybe you picked up as a minor or, um, or major in undergrad or whether it's something you've always wanted to delve into, but but really couldn't afford in your prior educational experiences. Um, the traditional program is personalizable um, for, for all of our students. Our other concentration is a research ethics concentration. It parallels the medicine, society, and culture concentration in that you would take an intensive seminar in the fall semester on research ethics, which gives you the history and a huge overview of issues in research ethics. There is a research ethics journal club, which our students love, looking at really contemporary issues that are happening right now, trying to figure out research ethics for contemporary um, society for cutting edge technologies, for political issues impacting health, et cetera. Um, and then in the spring semester for this concentration, there's a different required practicum. You would do your clinical rotations in the fall. And in the spring, you would actually be working hands-on in an institutional review board, IRB. You would somehow be working with research ethics and regulation. So our students who do that concentration, you know, sometimes go right into a career in research ethics management management and regulation um, at a university, at a hospital, um, or at a national organization. So every year we have a couple of students who actually want to do both of the concentrations. And that that's most of your electives right there. Um, but it is possible and we've structured it for students who really have a dual passion. Thanks for heading back to that, Dr. Jeanette. Sure. So why don't I ask you to also tell us a little bit yeah. more about what people need to know about study abroad. So for our short-term study abroad electives, these count as three credit hour electives for our students. Um, we actually open these up to all students across the university, not just students in our master's program, which make for fantastic discussions in the classroom, in the countries when you're doing your site visits, hearing from your speakers, um, getting to experience um, the, the different elements of your itinerary um, when you're in these different locations. But they're a fantastic way to deep dive into a specific area within bioethics and medical humanities, but also do a cross-cultural cross comparison at the same time. So for example, um, our Netherlands course does a focus on death, dying, and euthanasia. And I will say what's really been interesting about that course is when it was first developed many years ago, uh, medical aid in dying or assisted death, depending on how you term that, was not legal in any of the states in the, in the U.S. And it was legal in the Netherlands. Now we have, what is it, 10 or 12 states where it is legal, but it's still not legal in all 50 states, where policies in the Netherlands have even become more progressive and that they now include those with mental health conditions, provided they meet certain parameters. So it's been really interesting to see not just the cultural comparison as it is, but as it's moved through time and as things have changed in both countries. So that's just a preview of like what you can see on these courses. Great example. And in um, the Netherlands. We also have courses on women's health and public health. And, and exactly as Dr. Jeanette was saying, like being immersed to see how these things play out at those structural levels, but also at experiential levels is really stunning. And you're working with 
uh, with our faculty, but also in country faculty who are experts and are used to working with our students. The another one I just want to mention is why are the US national parks in there? We have created courses on environmental ethics and human health, which is another area of medical humanities and social medicine and actually very much embedded into the history of what is bioethics, um, including the biome. So um, those courses have also been uh, really exciting as travel courses, even though they're not international. But this is an awesome experience. Um, and these count as an elective class for the most part. And they take place um, during breaks. So winter break, spring break, or right in, in May after the semester has ended. So it fits really well into a student's schedule. So I'm happy to quickly just um, for the sake of time, talk about the application process. So if you're interested in applying to our program, which we would encourage you, know, you to do, um, required materials include transcripts, uh, personal essay. What we're looking for is why are you interested in bioethics and medical humanities and how does it fit into your career path? And that can include, you know, maybe you're in that um, that area of just looking for discernment too. And that's a perfectly um, great answer. Um, CV resume, of course, and then two letters of recommendation, um, including one from a faculty or some type of professor. Once we have your completed application, we'll review. We interview everyone for the program. Um, and usually um, from start to finish, once we have that completed application, it's about two to three weeks to render a decision. So we're pretty quick because we do um, rolling admissions, um, provided there isn't a major holiday, you know, in the middle of that, <laughs> or the university is closed for a uh, break. So, um, you know, I just want to say one more word yeah. about that also, which is that students will ask us or prospective students will ask us, hey, can can you pre-review my application? Can you take a look and see if I would be competitive um, and if I would be a good fit? Is this a good fit for me, for my goals? Um, in my career in education. And we're happy to do that. We do that on a regular basis. We'll give the contact information at the end of this slide deck. Um, and we welcome you to reach out if you're not sure, is this the right program for me? Because we want people to find the right fit and have a good experience in this program. And we can kind of help sort through. Sometimes we'll have people who maybe had trouble with one area of their coursework as an undergraduate. And so one area isn't as strong as the rest of their GPA. And they're wondering how that might affect their um, application package. And we're happy to talk that through. Right. And I do see we did have a question in the chat about international students. We welcome international students into our program. Absolutely. We've had a number over the years. They are a fantastic addition to our program. So if you're an international student, uh, we would very much encourage you to apply. Um, so in terms of deadlines, we're taking applications now. Um, we have a priority, what we call a priority one deadline, December 1st. What that means is if we have a completed um, application package, we can render a decision before the end of December. Um, if you can't meet that, that's okay. We have um, other deadlines and things as you can see. The final deadline though to keep in mind is August 1st, and that would be to start for that fall semester. So keep that in mind. Um, and then as uh, Dr. Anderson said, um, well, we can do some questions, but you know, if you want your application to be discussed beforehand, here's the email address to reach us at bioethics at case.edu. Happy to have a conversation with you specifically about your circumstance, your interest, your questions. And if it's not myself or Dr. Anderson, we can also connect you to the right person in the department to have that conversation as well. Definitely. And I want to mention um, one of the reasons to apply on the earlier side is, I think, one of the best parts of this program. Dr. Sadowski mentioned the, the amazing um, bench breadth and depth that we have at this university. And it really is stunning. Um, the, the breadth of disciplines 
um, you know, world class experts that we have on faculty and staff working with our master students. The other piece of things that is just um, amazing is the kind of experience our students can get while doing a master's degree. It looks like the kind of experience many, you know, PhD or other doctoral level students get elsewhere. So for example, quite a number of our students are involved in active research. I have a team right now, we're working on a publication where everybody the students who are working with me will be co-authors. Um, many of us author along with students. So many students will leave the MA program having you know, amazing research experience already. Um, some of those will will join with a project through various uh, mechanisms, but one that you should be aware of if you're interested in this program is we have a student assistantship program. And this is where it, it is a competitive program. So the earlier your application is, in the more competitive you will be. And our students will get some um, financial assistance um, by participating as a research assistant or a teaching assistant or a program assistant in the department. So this is an incredible opportunity for a master's student um, to, to help with maybe we have a, a awesome, vibrant undergraduate class that is a survey of medical humanities and social medicine. And some of our MSC concentrator students um, serve as teaching assistants in that class. Um, we also, we have students, you know, participate in other coursework as well, or, you know, are actively working for five or 10 hours a week on one of our many um, faculty research projects and getting training and exposure that usually helps them when they're, they're taking their next step. And those applications, you would indicate your interest in applying for an assistantship. Um, and we review them as they come in and have a final date in the spring, early summer, um, where we finish distributing those. And we do get asked about financial aid a lot. All the usual um, modes of graduate financial aid are available at the university, and we can put you in contact with the Department of Financial Aid um, if anyone needs assistance in thinking about um, that aspect of the program. So I'm seeing one kind of final question, and I think it's a good one for us to end on um, before we give final thoughts. And that's um, speaking briefly about part-time options and the dual degree of JDMA. So for part-time, that's absolutely an option for the program. Um, each student, how they do the part-time program is gonna be unique. So you would work um, with your faculty advisor to figure out the exact schedule that works for you. Some students just do fall, spring, some do fall, spring, summer. Um, but it's absolutely possible. We have a number of students every year that do a part-time option, um, whether they're working part-time all in addition or full-time and doing this program. So that's absolutely um, possible. And the JDMA dual degree program is a fantastic opportunity for students. For all dual degree programs, you have to apply and be accepted separately. So there are two separate applications. But if you're accepted into those independently, then you would be in the dual degree. Um, there are some shared credits, um, and that's one of the benefits of doing that dual degree program. And your first year of law school, you focus just on the law courses. It's your 2L year, so your second year that you start to add in the bioethics and medical humanities courses. But we have a number of students every year who do that dual degree. It's a fantastic uh, program, and we love having those students join our cohort every year. So Dr. And you can find the other dual degree programs on our website. Yes. So Dr. Sadowski and Dr. Anderson, I just wanted to ask if you had any kind of final closing thoughts for our attendees or for those who may be watching this uh, recording later on just to kind of wrap us up. Yeah, I think that I guess all I'd want to add is that I think you can see that 
This is um, really a distinctive program. There aren't many programs that bring all of these things together, where you can do medical humanities, where you can do social sciences and have clinical rotations in a medically significant city with a very rich medical heritage and have all of these study abroad programs and have research opportunities. It's really unusual to have all of those things in one place available to students. And I would build on that with two points. One is, you know, something that feels very special about the university, but definitely um, about the Department of Bioethics is that we have top-notch world-class faculty and we're grant funded and everyone is doing research um, at the highest level. And yet every single person, literally to a person, really cares passionately about students and about education. And that combo of, of not compromising on any front from in research and education is really um, inspiring and motivating and makes for a great atmosphere where everyone's contributions are part of the intellectual life of the department, which I love. Um, and the last point I wanted to make is um, another thing we hear from our students is that they feel like they've entered an alumni family. So we, um, you know, some of our students are just starting to look toward what am I going to do when I graduate? And we have such an amazing alumni network all over the country and all over the world that I don't think we've hit yet in the past few years, at least, a student who was reaching out for a mentor or networking in the field of their choice where that amazing alumni network, you know, came into play. So you you also join a community. And for some students, they are only with us for one year, but they end up feeling like they are part of the environment, the department, the family, the community um, for the rest of their careers. Well, thank you so much to Dr. Anderson and Dr. Sadowski for joining us today. It's been fantastic to hear from you. Um, and learn so much more about medicine, society, and culture, the concentration, and the fields and the interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary nature of it. Um, thank you to our attendees as well. Um, and as we said before, if you have any questions, you want to have a conversation, um, please email us, bioethics at case.edu. We look forward to hearing from you and hopefully reviewing your application soon.